All right. Well, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. And I'm glad you chose to spend your evening with us. And let's open in prayer before we get into the teaching. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, these two books of, of uh, Timothy that were written by Paul. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just all of these uh, tremendous insights that Paul has given to Timothy and then indirectly to us for us to be able to follow. And we pray, Lord, tonight that you give me the words that you would have these folks here. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, in 1884, the Statue of Liberty was given to the United States by France, commemorating the friendship between the two countries. The statue was 305 feet in size, and it, it, it went up into the air above any buildings at that point. Grover Cleveland dedicated the statue in 1886. As it was being assembled, a reporter noticed that every hair on the top of the head of the statue was perfectly in place. And that was quite an engineering feat because it had to be bent and it was metal, but it had to be flexible enough so that it could, it could move with the wind that would, it was going to be hit in the New York Harbor. The sculptor, Frederick Augusti Bartholdi, was asked, why? Why did you do that with the hair? No one was going to be able to see it. The statue was going to be higher than anyone could see, and the building wasn't tall enough for somebody to see over the top. There were obviously no aircraft that were flying at that time, so why would you take that kind of precise detail on something that no one was going to see? And his answer was, I strive for excellence. Everything I sculpt is done with perfection in mind. And little did he know that someday almost everyone flying in and out of New York City would have occasion to check out the details of his work as they would fly above the head of the Statue of Liberty. And in ministry, we see Paul demonstrating the same thing. Throughout his life as a Christian, Paul was concerned with the very details of his life. He wanted to make sure that everything he did would be devoted to the excellence as he served God. And now, as Paul is coming to the end of his life and waiting for his execution, he calls on Timothy to give the same attention and commitment to the details of his ministry as he assumes the mantle of Christian leadership from Paul. Paul commands Timothy to be excellent in all aspects of his ministry. Our scripture passage tonight is 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 4.22. And I've entitled it, The Marks of a Faithful Preacher. And I've broken it into three sections. The first is 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 17, all scripture breathed by God. The second one is 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8, preach the word. And then finally, 2 Timothy 9, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 22, personal instructions and final greetings. Well, Paul has just finished warning Timothy that false teaching has plagued the church during his time, and that Timothy should expect it in his time as well. He said people will continue to come into the church and masquerade as representatives of Christians and represent Christian truth, but in reality, they'll be there to deceive people. And Paul knows that Timothy will be taking on a key leadership role within the Ephesian church but also the whole evangelical movement in that area, since Paul will no longer be able to do that. He will replace Paul as the main spokesperson for Christianity. And he wants Timothy to hold the line against these false teachers, to guard the sound doctrine that was given to him, to be strong and a loyal defender of the truth. Well, how is he gonna do that? That's a, a huge task for someone as young as Timothy to be able to do so. And, and what Paul is doing is basically encouraging Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, you have what it takes. Why? Because I taught you. You have a strong spiritual mentor in me. And I know that I spent 20 years with you, and I poured the truth into you so you understand exactly what it is that needs to be communicated to people. You know exactly what the truth is because I gave it to you. You should pattern your life after me. You followed my example of uncompromising loyalty, and that was true in my life, and now you set your life in that same pattern. Regardless of the price, 
Again, Paul ominously tells Timothy to expect persecution. So use me as an example when you face persecution. Think back to how you saw me handle it. Carefully review what you saw in my life and then represent that and reproduce it in your life as well. He tells him that you followed my teaching. And we know that. We know Timothy spent a great amount of time with Paul, and he was basically his spiritual son. God, he, Paul poured into him God's revelation, the, apostle, the apostle's doctrine, and he saw his conduct. He saw how he lived his life daily. He saw his life when he was not being persecuted, and he saw his life when he was being persecuted. And he said, continue, do the same thing. You're now, I'm passing the baton on to you, Timothy. And his ministry is what you teach and how you live. You have the example, Timothy, so do it, right? He saw you, he said, you saw me in the sufferings that I had. And it's interesting, he mentions, you know, kind of, you know, uh, Antioch, and then he, you know, Iconium, and then Lystra. Lystra was Timothy's hometown. Now, think about it. The story tells us in Acts that when Paul went into Lystra, he healed a cripple. And immediately, he was then basically stoned for, for, one, they thought he was a god, but then secondly, the Jews had riled up the people of that town to stone him. And here's a young Timothy, probably in his adolescent years, watching this guy come in and dogmatically teach the scriptures to be stoned for it. And if you, if you follow the story, Paul was taken out of the city dumped on the trash pile thinking he was dead, and he recovered and came back in and continued to preach. So that left an imprint on Timothy as, as a youngster. He watched that example of Paul. Timothy sees all of this. The Lord delivered me, he says. Remember, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus are going to be persecuted. He doesn't candy coat it for Timothy, saying, ah, oh, don't worry, that was just me. I was a pioneer, they get all the arrows. No, he was saying, if you're going to preach the word of God, you're going to get resistance. And the point here is if you're disobedient, if you're weak, if you're uninvolved, if you're apathetic to the gospel, you're never going to be persecuted. Satan won't waste his time with you. But if you live godly in Christ Jesus, Satan is coming after you. That's the message that he gives to Timothy, and he doesn't tell Timothy to be apathetic. He tells him to preach with a gusto, preach with a confidence because of the truth that he's learned. And he's, why does he have to do this? And he says, because evil men are getting worse internally and collectively, their impact is worse, right? So think about, you now have 2,000 years since this letter has been written, and if you think of how mankind has gotten worse and worse and more sinful and more sinful and have allowed more and more things to go on in life. I mean, it's pretty evident to see that we're in a decline morally in our, in our overall human, human mankind. But he's saying, you can't worry about that. You have to continue to step, stay to the strong set of convictions that you have developed in your spiritual foundation. And you got that from your mother and you got it from your grandmother. And think about it, Timothy was in a unique place. He had learned and become convinced of things that were truth regarding the word of God, but he had been taught all of the Old Testament scriptures. He had been taught about looking forward to the Messiah. He had been taught about how man was sinful and that they couldn't, you know, they had to offer sacrifices to commune with their God. And so he understood the history of the Jewish people. And now he spent as, as, a, as a protege of, of Paul, all of the time where Paul then opened up all of the revelation of the New Testament, all the things that Christ had told Paul, all of the things that Paul was now sharing as an apostle. So Timothy had a strong foundation of both the Old Testament and the New Testament that was given to him and why he was such a great candidate to replace Paul. So he said, continue in the things that you've learned, not only from your mother and your grandmother, but also from me. Don't deviate from what you've been taught. Continue. Don't let anything change your convictions because they're accurate. And then he says, and you also understand why you need to do this because of personal experience. You know what the sufficiency and authority of God's word has done, right? The word of God is supreme. Timothy, you've been taught it, but you've also seen it. You've traveled with me. You've seen how the word of God is so strong. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
you've seen what it's done to the lives of people that have, have, have embellished or taken a look at it and really enmeshed it into their lives, right? And, and so he's saying, don't give up on those things. Timothy, all your life, you've been given solid foundational truth. You've been given correct doctrine. And I don't want you now to shy away from that as persecution starts to pick up. Use me as an example. He keeps referring, look at me, look at me, look at me. And we see Paul in a dungeon being ready to be killed, still speaking about the truth, not to dilute it, not to change it, not to tickle the ears of men, but to speak candidly what the word of God says. Pretty impressive to hear that. And Timothy was committed to the fact that all scripture was inspired by God, not by man. All scripture is the inspired words of God. God breathed, if you will. God speaks and man records. So what Paul is saying is, Timothy, the scripture is sufficient to equip the man for every good work. In other words, you don't have to do anything other than talk about what the scripture says. Your job isn't to convert people. That's God's job. Your job is to tell. Your job is to evangelize. Your job is to, to preach it from the pulpit in your church. That's what you need to do. And don't you ever dilute it. Don't you ever change from it. Don't you ever take away the foundation you have and be tempted to kind of tone it down so people won't persecute you. Because that's not what God is asking us to do. Paul goes on and talks about kind of what scripture can do. And I want you to do something, right? This is Paul writing to Timothy as a preacher. But I want you to take Timothy out, and I want you to insert yourself in. I want you to think about it as if Paul is writing these things directly to you. And I'll tell you, if you do, it will change your life. And for the last week, I've been walking around practicing that. And I'm telling you what, I can't even look in a mirror anymore. Because when I do, I swear the reflection in that mirror is saying, and another thing you need to do, right? It, it, it convicts you to really go after your own life and kind of put a filter on it to say, am I doing these things that Paul is telling Timothy? And yes, he's talking to a preacher, but he's talking to us as well. These are the same things that we need to incorporate into our life in order to pursue excellence, in order to finish well in order to finish and say, I have no regrets in the life that I've lived while I was here on earth. So think about it in that regard as Paul ticks through all of these things that he's encouraging Timothy to do. First thing he tells him to do is that scripture is there for teaching. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, it means imparting the truth. It means the scripture gives you the body of truth by which you're to think and act. It's a standard, it's a barometer, it's a way to measure how you're living your life. And as you study the scripture, you accumulate that body of truth. Sometimes you say, well, boy, that's a mature Christian. How did they get there? And I'll guarantee you it has to do with an intense study of scripture. It has to do with them consistently digesting what the word of God says and then applying it to their life with the strength of the Holy Spirit. And the more you study, the more attached you become to God's standard of behavior, and, and then you develop and mature as a Christian. Scripture provides for the saved person a repository of truth and principles for life and thought. That's what Paul is telling him in this verse. But if you don't know it, you can't do it. That's what he's saying. So Timothy, not only have you learned it, but you got to stay in the scripture. If you're going to teach it, you yourself have to immerse yourself in that scripture as well. You know what? I learned something this week that I, I never knew. And it has to do with the spiritual armor. And I was, I was cross-referenced over to look at it. And if you, if you know that verse, you know it talks about a helmet and a breastplate. And it talks about a shield. And it talks about your feet being shod. But you know what it also says? There's one offensive weapon, and that's called the sword of the spirit. And what I didn't know is when you read what that actual word in Greek means, the sword, it's defined as a dagger that's about six inches long. So it's not the big sword they took into battle. It's a small one. It's a small, precise weapon needed to be used in a precise manner in order to deliver a fatal blow. So what does that mean? It means that you have to understand scripture. And when you're tempted by Satan or you're tempted by anything, 
that you know exactly in scripture how to work against that temptation. And you have that, that spirit, that you have that sword, that if you precisely will, will plunge it, it will know exactly how to defend it. Think about the example of Jesus. When he was tempted by Satan, what did he do? He precisely quoted scripture to refute what Satan was saying. And that's what this is used for as well. The spiritual armor, it's an offensive weapon, but it's got to be used precisely based on the knowledge that you have of scripture. And if you don't know scripture, you really can't defend yourself. And so that's what Paul is telling Timothy to make sure that he understands. That's how you ward off temptations. Then he talks about reproof. Well, what does reproof mean? It means refuting error. So scripture also can convict one of misbehavior or to rebuke false teaching. Well, I think Timothy's going to find that comes in pretty handy because he's been thrust into a church that is ripe with false teaching. It calls people back from error. It cuts away at the sin within one's life. In the Greek, this was another interesting point. The word or the phrase that he's using is the way they would refute error. The way they would, would reprove someone is they would march him into court. So if a criminal was going into court, there was a soldier that had a, a, a knife underneath his chin, making him keep his head up to look at the people that he had wronged, to come directly into confrontation with people that were yelling at him, or maybe the family that had been offended. But he couldn't put his head down or he would slice his throat. That's what he's talking about here, right? He high, you, you want to highlight the shame and guilt so that the criminal had to face the people he had wronged. And if we apply it to scripture, it's, it's jamming its pierced point under your chin and making you face the one whom you've sinned against. So you look into the scripture and you see what it says to correct. You're being reproved, but, but you have to keep your head up to look at it, to understand it, and then to look at God in the face and basically say, you know what, I repent. You've convicted me through scripture of a sin area in my life, and now I know it's a sin area and I'm repenting. It's the word of a convictor of sin. It sifts, it analyzes, it reveals emotions and attitudes and thoughts. Paul's point, if you're truly God's child, you hunger after what is right, and you hunger after righteousness. And exposure of sin in your life should be a welcome process. So as you read the scriptures, you should be feeling, this is great. This is something I need to apply in my life. And if there's sin there, I need to repent. That's what scripture does. It reproves. The word teaches the principles of truth. And the word will convict and reprove the sinner. But it also removes false teaching and error. We've talked about this in the past. If I know scripture, then I can recognize error. The measure by which all teaching must be measured. Right. So so if we know scripture and someone is teaching something that's not in scripture, we immediately know it's false and we can reject it and not listen to it at all. Paul goes on and he says scripture is used for correction to straighten someone up is the Greek phrase for it, rebuilding and restoring. So after scripture basically cuts you open and exposes the sin area in your life, it then comes alongside and and has the ability to correct it, but then to after uh, to, to straighten you up or to encourage you in your walk. So a convicting part of it, but then a building up part of it as well, all contained in scripture. And that's why Paul is saying, Timothy, you've got to know scripture. You've got to stay to that platform. If you're going to teach people, you got to teach them the right way. You can't just go in and cut them down and then not be there to build them up. You have to be able to understand where in scripture they can find those things. He finally says, and it's also training in righteousness. Wow. Well, that's spiritual training that he's talking about. You feel the conviction. You've repented. Now it gives instruction to build the reader back up again. It trains it. It basically brings one to spiritual maturity. The first identify the sin, but then instructs what's the right way to go. And if you follow that pattern and continue to expose sin in your life through scripture and then bring repentance with the Holy Spirit convicting and driving you, Boy, that then suddenly is the sanctification that takes place in a spiritually mature person. And so Paul is making sure Timothy understands how powerful that scripture is that he's learned all his life. But now, how does he use that going forward as he assumes the mantle of leadership within the Christian church? It uses the doctrinal content of scripture to train you. 
It's our growth. It's our training. It's our maturing. It's all based on the content that's within the word. You need the word so that you grow and we should long for it. That's what he's telling you. It should be something that you're spending time in every day. Do you see what I mean when you put yourself in place of Timothy? It's as if God is talking to you directly. Are you doing these things? Do you understand what is being asked of you as a Christian? It's not that you're saved and you sit back and that's the extent. No, it's continue to grow and it's continue to push the kingdom forward. The word trains us in the right things, the right behavior, the right conduct, the right thinking, the right actions, and the right words that we should be using. The result, if we do that, then every Christian is competent. They're perfect. They're mature. They're complete. They're fully qualified and equipped. And the process is completed by the word of God. And it says it's adequate to fully equip every believer for every good work. Why? Because the word of God always accomplish what it wants to do. The problem isn't the word of God or the scripture. The problem is us. Do we spend enough time really understanding it to be able to use it as a way for us to become more mature? Are we in it enough to really talk to other people about what Christianity is if we ourselves don't really understand scripture? So Paul is, is saying to Timothy, that's the foundation. You have to start there. You've, you've started it. You've built on it from your mother and grandmother. You added to it when I was there. But now, Timothy, I'm going to be gone. Your grandmother's going to die. You now have to pick this up and follow through. And not only do you have to do it, but you have to teach other people how to do it. So this is what Paul is pouring his heart into the, to the, the veracity that, that Timothy needs to go after Scripture and to do it. So Timothy, or us, speak the truth of God's word and let the Lord open your heart and understand what it is he's trying to tell you. He shifts now. When you get to chapter four, he says, basically, this is preaching the word. As Paul writes, this is the final chapter in his life. He wants to impart to Timothy what it takes to be the type of preacher that God demands. He gives him a series of commands that he must follow. These aren't, say, hey, Timothy, you might want to consider, or you might want to do this. He's commanding him that he needs to do this, right? And, and so this, again, is where I think you want to put yourself in this and say, am I doing this? Am I able to talk to other people the way Paul is telling Timothy he must do? And the first thing he says, you got to understand how serious this is, right? As a pastor, Timothy is going to be accountable to Christ. He says that right in the first verse. He'll have to give an account on how he handled his ministry when he faces Christ when he returns again. We talked about this in our small group, right? There's a crown of righteousness awaiting the, the believer, but he's also going to be accountable for what we did. You know, are your actions here on earth, were they precious stones or were they hay and stubble, right? Were you doing things that really didn't do anything to push the kingdom forward? So, so what Paul is saying is like, look, you, you can't relax. You have, you're, I'm charging you in the presence of Jesus Christ and God that you follow through on what I'm saying, that you preach and you preach the, the truth and don't back off. And if you don't do that, now you've got to answer to God. And we do too, right? We as well are going to be judged. Judge is the wrong word. We're going to be evaluated on what did we do with our spiritual gifts. When we get to heaven, what did you do in the body when you were on earth? Did you follow through? Did you use your gifts? Did you really follow scripture? Were you bold? Were you courageous? Did you draw on my strength? All of those things we're going to be held accountable for. And he basically says Christ is going to be the one who's going to judge. He's going to evaluate, right? And he's aware of every single detail, Timothy, that you're going to do or not do. And the same thing is true for us as well. We're already saved. And now we're evaluated and, you know, when, the, when Christ comes again to determine what type of reward shall we receive in heaven. All through the New Testament, it talks about don't waste your time. What are you doing? How, how are you going to be in the kingdom? What rewards are you going to receive? Don't jeopardize your reward. It talks all through that. And that's based on what we do that scripture commands us to do. And the judgment for non-believers is a little bit tougher. It's an evaluation for us, but it's final judgment for those. And again, that should, should bug us too. The, all the people that we know that aren't Christians, what are we doing to bring them on? 
And the point that Paul is making here, right in the, this last chapter, Timothy, you have to realize the seriousness of your calling. The one evaluating you is going to render his decision on the nature and the dedication and the faithfulness and the consistency of your efforts, right? And that's again, where we talk about gold, silver, and precious stones and wood, hay, or stubble. The wood, hay, and stubble is gonna be burned up because it's useless. Doesn't mean it was sinful. It just means that it didn't really do anything to push the kingdom forward. And Timothy, that's not what I want for you. And, and if you follow my life, I'm waiting for a crown of righteousness, but I'm also waiting for the reward because my efforts were gold, silver, and precious stones. Every day I got up and did something to push the kingdom forward. And Timothy, you can do the same thing as well. And Timothy needed to hear this because he was going to get an awful lot of pressure to compromise and to please men. And Paul, in his last gasp, in his last letter that he's ever written, is encouraging Timothy not to yield to that temptation to dilute or to bring in a lower level of scripture. Preach it like it's written, because it's God-breathed. And he's, he's saying to understand what your commission is. Preach the word. He's saying publicly proclaim the word of God. And this is tough for Timothy. Remember, he's a younger guy. He doesn't want to debate false teachers. He's a little intimidated by the Jews and the Romans and the persecution. He's watched Paul get beaten up all his life. And now he's asked to take over a church that is mired in false teaching. And now you've got Nero on the warpath to wipe out Christians. An awful tough time for Timothy to come in. But you know what? What do we have today? You know what? David brought up in a leaders meeting, there were commercials on the Super Bowl yesterday or on Sunday that talked about Jesus and the backlash, the backflow that's come from people criticizing and trying to destroy the company that is advertising what Christ can do is just as much persecution as Timothy was facing back then. And we're going to face the same thing. And guess what? It's going to get worse because it tells us that men are going to become more and more evil and they're going to turn away from the truth. Right? And he said, in spite of that persecution, preach the word. Why? Because it's God that's speaking. It's not the words of man. It's the words of God. In essence, it brings the teacher into direct contact with the mind of the Holy Spirit. Did you ever think of that? When you're studying scripture, you're actually in the mind of the Holy Spirit that inspired the writers of God. This isn't something that is an interesting novel that you pick up and read. These are the very words of God. And if you don't approach it that way, then you're not reading scripture the right way. He said, you have to understand the scope of what you're undertaking here, Timothy, you have to be ready to preach at all times. You have to be on duty at all times. You have to seize every opportunity. I have a good friend who's a pastor, and he says he loves doing funerals because at every funeral, there's usually unsaved people that are there. And the funeral might be for a Christian that was in his church, but the family members weren't saved. And he said, I don't know how many times the family members have said, you know, don't get too religious. Don't offend the people that are there. They're not spiritual. And you know what he tells them? He said, they're going to hear the word. They're going to hear the gospel preached at this funeral. And if you can't understand that, then you got to find somebody else to do the funeral. He's ready to preach at any time. And he understands that the unsaved person is going to go to hell forever. And he can't tolerate that. He wants to speak whenever it, it's, it's available. He said, you have to have the zeal to preach. And, you know, I, I mean, I learned this idea of the small sword, and I had never seen it before, and I couldn't wait to share that information. I had pulled something new out of Scripture that I never knew was there before. And what he's saying is, Timothy, as you read Scripture, as you learn things, as you, it, it, the Holy Spirit gives you an interpretation that you didn't have before, preach it. Tell people. Don't get up there in the podium and see the false teachers that are sitting in the, in the congregation and, and tone it down. You bring the heat. You bring exactly what the word of God says and be excited about it because it's the truth in season and out of season. That means when it's convenient or when it's not convenient, every opportunity, you're ready to share the news of, of why you, know, you are a Christian. Right. And, and he then says you're going to use scripture also to rebuke, reprove and rebuke. Those are interesting words. Reprove has to do with the mind, knowing that it's wrong. It's unbiblical. Rebuke has to do with the heart, has to do with the conviction that you're guilty, 
It convicts the sinner of his sin. And so he's saying, look, you encourage him, right? First, you're going to rebuke him, but then you're encouraging him. You're calling him to restoration. You come alongside after confronting them and encourage them to take steps to change. Isn't that what we try to do? Don't we try to tell people about sin and that, that if they don't confess their sin and don't believe in Christ, that they're going to spend eternity in hell? Well, how do I do that? Well, you better be prepared, Timothy, to answer that question. And the same for us as well. Can we get up and give a cogent explanation of why we believe what we believe? Can we quote scripture and tell people what is there? We don't just convict them of sin and say, oh, you're a sinner. If you don't do something, you're going to hell. No, you don't leave them there. They don't know what to do with that. So you come alongside. Once they're there and they're searching, you make sure they understand sin, but then you also understand salvation. How do they get there? And scripture is, is full of information on that. And you have to know where to put them. You have to know where that they can read. When you give them a Bible, tell them what to read to answer the questions that they're asking you. But then he comes back and he says, you got to have patience, right? You got to, when you're teaching, be patient with people. And you, well, why? Because people don't change that quickly. How many times have you witnessed to somebody? How many times do you think, oh, they're close? They understand what I'm saying, but then nothing happens because they fall back to what they know, or they look at it and boy, that's too hard, or I don't want to give up what I'm doing, or I'm attracted to worldly, whatever the answer is, the, the, you've got to be patient. You can't sit there and say, gee, how many times do I have to tell you? No, that's not the way you're going to win people over. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. You got to do it in the right way. We should all be preaching the gospel whenever possible, whenever the opportunity arises. And we too will be judged or evaluated for how we have done that. Have you ever thought of that? How many times you've missed an opportunity to talk to somebody and someday you're going to stand before Christ and he's going to say, hey, you remember back on February 12th in, in 2023, you missed it. You were talking to that lady in the shopping mall and, and you missed it. You had an opportunity. She was asking questions and you basically looked at your watch and said, I had to go. Christ doesn't miss anything. And that's what Timothy has to understand. He's been put into a position. He's been given gifts. He's got the Holy Spirit. He's been endorsed by the church. He knows the Old Testament. He knows the New Testament. It's game time, Timothy. You got to go out now and execute on this, and you're going to be judged for that. And he tells him he's got to do it with a sense of urgency, right? Timothy, do it now. Don't wait. The time was going to come when people are going to depart from the faith. They'll no longer listen nor hear. Boy, that's a scary thing. But you know what? We see that in our churches as we water down the message, right? When you hear the prosperity gospel, God wants you to be a Christian and then he's gonna reward you with money and you're gonna have a life with no more problems. That's watering it down, right? That's not giving the full gospel. So he said, you have to be fearless and teaching the truth because it's gonna become all the more necessary until people will so tune it out that it doesn't matter what you say, they're not gonna listen. So do it now. And again, we have that same urgency now. I look around at this world and, and I can't believe how it has deteriorated. And you try engaging someone in a spiritual conversation and they tune you out or they ridicule or they basically say, I don't believe that. They've tuned out. They've already stopped listening. Or if they do come, they want their ears tickled, as it says. <clears throat> they want to hear nice things, right? We've used the phrase bunny rabbits, right? They want all soft little stories that are there. They don't want to hear anything about their personal sin. They want, to, they want to leave church feeling uplifted, not convicted. And that's, that's you know, a sad part. Think about how homosexuality, how gender fluidity, how abortion has made its way now into the mainstream of life, all areas of sin, and you have churches splitting over these issues. The, the gospel is so clear, but yet they're splitting over it. That's what he's talking about, right? They're going, no longer going to listen or hear. They're going to reject any gospel message. So you got to do it now and you got to do it with authority because they're going to pile up teachers in accordance with their own passions. What does that mean? Well, they're going to give us pastors, give us people who say what we want to hear. And the preacher, they least the like to hear, brings the message they most need to hear. That's what he wants Timothy to do. They don't want to hear it, but they need to hear it. If they're going to become saved, they got to hear the truth, Timothy, and you're the guy that's being picked to do it. So if they don't listen, they're going to start believing myths and then delusions, 
and not the truth. There will be no confrontation or conviction, just entertainment. So the time is coming and we can all argue the time is here. We have the same thing with the people we try to talk to. And he, he finishes up by saying, you know, the attitude that you have to have as you're fulfilling this job, Timothy, you gotta be sober minded. You gotta be sober minded in all things. You gotta be self-contained. You gotta be steadfast. Every faculty that you have has to be kind of, in, you have to be in control and command of those. And people that pursue excellence won't compromise the word of God. They'll stand up there and in complete control, they will speak to their, their audience and tell them exactly what the word of God says. And Timothy, I need you to do that. That's what I'm writing to you about. And now he tells them the cost, right? Accept it. There's going to be suffering. Expect it. The more faithful to the word, the more pain that you should expect. Hebrews 13, 23 says, and we talked a little bit about this in our small group. Did Timothy hear him? Did he execute on what he said? And again, I, I stumbled across this today. First time I've ever seen it. Hebrews 13, 23 says, you should know that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Timothy got arrested. Timothy was persecuted and he didn't fall back. He didn't denounce Christianity. He said, I'm going to prison rather than, than turn down the word of God. I mean, that was so encouraging to hear because you hear all of these things about Timothy not being courageous or not being bold or being young. And yet here, when the metal, you know, when the rubber hit the road, he stood up for what he believed. And he did model what Paul did. He went to prison because of his belief. And that's what we need to be, understand, that there is going to be persecution. Maybe not prison yet, but there's certainly going to be persecution in the society that we live in. Final thing is the extent. He said, do the work of an evangelist, Timothy. You're a teaching pastor. Preach the gospel. You're going to be shepherding the sheep that are in your church, but don't forget about the lost. You have to continue to evangelize the lost, both within the church and within the greater community of Ephesus. Don't forget, you're constantly trying to win souls to Christ. Spurgeon had a great line, Charles Spurgeon, where he said, Give the ungodly no rest in their sins. And what he's saying, Timothy, I want you preaching all the time. I don't want any respite for somebody who isn't a believer. I want you to badger them and continue to bring the word in its full dimension. Don't water it down. Don't tickle their ears. Give them the truth. And that's true for us as well. And what's the goal, Timothy? Why am I writing you this letter? Fulfill your service. Do it with all your might. Finish the race so when you look back on your life, you'll be able to say, I did everything I was asked to do. Now I'm ready to go home, just like Paul is. I'm ready to depart and spend eternity in heaven with Christ. That's the letter that Paul is kind of finishing. That's the last written letter that we have from Paul, and he writes it to Timothy to encourage him, and we're encouraged because of that as well. And really, the final part we see in this section is Paul. And there's three verses, and you could, you could probably have three lectures on these three verses, right? It's a summary of Paul's life in verses 6, 7, and 8 of chapter 4. And it's basically, Timothy, I hope and pray that you come to the end of your life like this, triumphantly and victoriously. And how are you going to do that? Well, let me tell you about my life. And he starts off in verse 6, and he talks about the present. And he said, I'm poured out as a drink offering. My time of departure is here. So therefore, Timothy, step up. It's your turn now to take the baton and run that part of the race. Poured out as a drink off, off goes back to Numbers 15. The Israelites were wandering in the wilderness because of the sins of their forefathers. They were getting frustrated. It was, it was towards the end where they almost all had died out. So God gives them some instruction. He says, when you get into the promised land, you're going to have to offer sacrifices. You're going to offer an animal that's going to be sacrificed on the, on, the, on the altar. And then on top of that, you're going to offer a meal offering. And then the final drink offering is a soothing aroma to the Lord. The drink offering was the capstone of the sacrifice in the Old Testament. And, and to, Paul pulls that example out in his own life. And he said, I've already given myself as a living sacrifice. I've got 30 years of, of service as, as a missionary. I can't give anymore. This is the final act of my complete dedication to the Lord. 
my life will be poured out as a drink offering, as a soothing aroma to the Lord, a, a life well lived that was devoted to Christ. And the other interesting thing, he uses the word departure. He doesn't say, I'm going to be beheaded. He doesn't say, I'm going to be executed. He doesn't say, I'm going to be killed. He said, I'm ready to depart. Now, listen to what the Greek word, the definition for depart was. Unyoking an animal from a cart or a plow from a yoke. Rest from labor, basically, is, is one way to say it. The other definition is loosening chains on a prisoner. So he's freed from the chains he experienced here on earth and now goes to heaven a free man. It also says loosening a tent to take it down. And Paul, being a tent maker, basically says, this is the final time that I'm going to take down my tent. And then the last one, it's the slipping of the ropes to let a ship leave the harbor, earth to heaven. So Paul knows exactly the word that he wants to use that talks about him leaving this earth after a life well done, following the direction of Christ and the direction of scripture, and now he's setting sail to spend eternity in heaven. What a great visual picture that he gives. Verse 7 then takes a look at his past. So he goes back and he said, you know what? I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. It's a completed action. He's looking back saying, I did everything. I left it all on the field. I trained. I did everything I was supposed to, and I won the race, right? I finished the course, and I kept the faith. No regrets, no sadness, no sense of unfulfillment. What God called me to do, I did. It's a life work completed for the glory of God. That's what he's telling Timothy, and he's telling him because he wants Timothy and us to model that life, to do the same things that he did. It's a, He said, look, I had a spiritual struggle, right? I fought Satan. I fought the, the law of sin. I, I felt per persecution. All of those things were in my heart day in and day out. It was warfare every day. And it wasn't part-time for me. It was full-time. Every day I got up and said, what can I do to push the kingdom of heaven forward today? And that was his priority. He didn't get waylaid right? He didn't get uh, set aside by other things. Hebrews talks about a besetting sin or, or something that, that would encumber you from actually going forward. And, and what Paul is saying is there's only two things that can stop me. One is an encumbrance, right? You don't run a race with a raincoat on, right? He's saying, I shed all of the things that would keep me from doing what I needed to do to push the kingdom forward. And the other thing is sin, I did nothing to sin to disqualify myself from, from fulfilling the cause that Christ gave to me. And he said it was a noble cause. It was a good fight. It was the cause of Christ and the advancement of his kingdom. And, and what he's saying to Timothy is have the courage to live the life that I'm describing to you. Great quote that was in there. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. And that's what he's trying to communicate to Timothy. Be bold. Understand that, yes, you're going to be fearful, but understand also that God is with you just like he was with me. And he said, finish the course. Avoid wandering off. Have the self-discipline to stay on course, right? Don't be waylaid by things of this world. You never hear about Paul wasting his time in needless things. Everything was always about who else can I talk to? When he was ready to go to Jerusalem, and, and they came down and said, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound. You're going to be thrown in prison. And he, and he kind of shrugs and he goes, yeah, but my priority is to go witness in Jerusalem. I don't care what happens to me. And that's what he's saying to Timothy. Look at my life. For 30 years, yes, I was persecuted, but I never deviated from the course. Why? Because I trusted Christ. Why? Because I knew the scriptures. Why? Because I knew what needed to be said to the unsaved. All of these things, he's saying, Timothy, I learned them, you can learn them, but you can't do it on your own strength. You've got to do it with the power of God and the Holy Spirit. He guarded his time, right? Every moment was filled with the maximum effort. He kept the faith. It said the word of God compelled him to his ministry, to obey it, to proclaim it, never to compromise it. Effort under the direction of the word of God. So again, he emphasizes the scripture being a core foundation for Timothy and his life. 
to em embrace it, to, to digest it, to implement it in his life, just like Paul is demonstrating here in verse 7. And then finally in verse 8, he basically says, let's look at the future. I am so ready now to get out of here, to depart this world. I'm ready for the crown of righteousness awarded to me by the Lord. When he welcomes me into his kingdom and says, well, well done, my good and faithful service. All that's left now is for me to receive my reward. And it's going to be a life in heaven without sin. Everybody who believes in Christ and has, has become a Christian is going to receive this crown. It's the eternal life and glory in the presence of God. That's what he's looking forward to, that he will spend eternity there without persecution, without sin, without him battling his own bodies and his infirmities. He will now live forever in, in the presence of God. So what do we have here? Second Timothy, the last part is, is chapter 4, 9 through 22. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You can read it. He says four things. Timothy, come see me. Others, secondly, others had left Paul for various reasons. Fear, love of the world, ministry. But including during his first trial, he said, there is nobody there. But God was with me to help me preach the gospel. Romans had two types of uh, two parts of a trial. The first, you went in and pled your case. Prosecution said, this guy over here is, is preaching the word of God. It's outlawed. He's, he's looking at it as an insurrectionist. And they have all these people that would testify. And now the judge looks at Paul and he says, and what do you have in your defense? And he looks around and there's nobody behind him, right? They all fled because they were fearful. That's what he's talking about. In my first trial, there was nobody there to support me. And so he's all alone, but he's got Christ. He's so confident. It doesn't matter if anybody's there or not. He's got Christ. And he basically said he gave me the, the power to basically preach the gospel, even when he's being convicted of an insurrectionist and he's convicted of breaking the Roman law. That's the kind of power you want. He says, greet people. And there's a whole list of names in there you can look at. And then he's basically said, I'm going to finish. The last thing I'm going to ever write is that I want the Lord to sustain you with great measures of his grace. That's a guy who's got a heart for the Lord. And now he knows he's passing the baton on to the next generation and looks with, with glee to be able to now spend eternity in heaven, to depart, to be able to spend it with Christ, worshiping him day in and day out. Thankful and, and very positive about the life that he's left as an example for Timothy and for us to follow. It's a great way, great way to finish a life. So what do we take away from this scripture? How can we finish our lives like the Apostle Paul, who lived and breathed the word of God every day? How do we ensure that we continually live under the authority of God's word and be committed to the reality of a spiritual struggle that we'll face in our lives and yet live a life of self-discipline to stay on course and not get diverted from God's plan for our lives. How do we do that, right? Charles Spurgeon put it like this, <clears throat> according to the measure of grace extended to him or her by the Holy Spirit, each person is bound to minister in his day and generation, both to the church and among unbelievers, to exert themselves to the utmost to extend the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ pretty direct. And I think in this chapter, in this second epistle that he writes to Timothy, we have the answers to what we need to do to live a life like Paul. The question is, do we have the desire? Do we have the ability to put things of this world aside and focus entirely on Christ as Paul did? Let me conclude with a story. In 1904, William Borden graduated from high school. You may recognize the name Borden. That was from the dairy fortune. Remember Elsie the cow? I don't think they've canceled her yet, but Elsie the cow was, was the, the, uh, the Borden, for, uh, Borden dairy. He was worth millions of dollars as an 18 year old in 1904. His graduation gift from high school was a cruise around the world. I got a pair of Nick tickets, but anyway. As he visited cities throughout the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, his letters home identified a growing burden and a passion and compassion for lost people. 
He wrote to his mother, I believe God is calling me to be a missionary. Another letter said, I'm sure God is calling me and I'm going to the mission field. Well, that wasn't in the family plan. He was the most gifted of all the Borden children and he was earmarked to take over the family business. He came home from his trip and then spent four years at Yale preparing for the mission field. And then another three years where he went to seminary. He gave away much of the fortune that he had inherited. In his Bible, he wrote in the back flap, no reserves, two words. Basically, I have nothing but trust. I've given everything away. God will supply my needs. Sound like Paul? He earnestly began to pray where God would send him, convicted that he should go to China, particularly to a group of Muslims that had settled there. Just prior to leaving, his father became extremely ill and didn't have long to live. The family tried to talk William out of his plans. We'll give you dad's office. We'll give you a huge salary. You pick whatever car you want. We'll buy it for you. Please stay. Now, there was a selfish motive because the other kids weren't capable of doing it. And they all had stock tied to the board and company. So they wanted William to run the company. But instead, he opened his Bible and wrote underneath in the back, no retreat. He said, no return, no reserves and no retreat. I'm not giving up on my plan to be a missionary. On his voyage overseas, he stopped in Egypt where he contracted cerebral meningitis and was dead within a month. All that preparation for nothing. But when they found his Bible after his death, they saw in the back flap, said no reserves, no retreat, and he had written no regrets. He lived his life to the maximum dedication to God. And if he were to die, that was God's choice. And that's what Paul is imparting to Timothy. It may cost you your life. It may cost you pleasures of this world. It may cost you persecution. It may cost you pain, but no regrets. And Paul is saying that as someone who has experienced that for 30 years of unbearable persecution, and he looks back at his life and he says, no regrets. That's the way you want to end your Christian walk here on the, in the, on the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sobering words from Paul to Timothy as his life expires. And Lord, we know these words are applicable to Timothy and must have encouraged him and scared him to death. But Lord, he followed through. We know that he followed through and became a great servant of yours, just as his mentor Paul was. And Lord, all we can ask is that you infuse us with the same power and the same motivation and same desire to accomplish in this life the things that you would have us do to push your kingdom forward. We ask this in your name. Amen.